Hey everybody! Hello! Welcome Hi. to X... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to S Plus Marketing Live. I don't know where X came from. <laughs> anyway. Kisses and hugs. Kisses and so, hugs, that's so. it. Welcome to Our episode coach. 20. The name of today's episode is PPC, Timely Content Ideas, and Ketchup. Because apparently we always choose a food item. I don't know. It just happens. Um, we're really happy to see you guys here with us this week. Um, so this is S Plus Marketing Live. We're here to help you feel and be smarter about what's happening in the marketing world right now. What is S Plus Marketing Live? I'm so glad you asked, you guys. S Plus Marketing is marketing based on the ultimate human technology stories. Our team is here from Story Collaborative. We're a group of growth marketing consultants. So while we do our introductions, if you all would start a watch party, we would really appreciate it. How do you start a watch party? If you're not familiar um, from the video you're watching, you can click a share button at the bottom and then click start a watch party. If you're not seeing the share button, just click on the video, let it expand and you can find the share and watch party from there. So Dave, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dave. No, uh, I'm nice to meet you. I'm Dave Mills, <laughs> uh, and this is S Plus Marketing Live. What am I doing? All right. I'm the chief growth officer here, and so my job is to find nifty ways to grow and to help others grow as well. I really enjoy digging in to kind of the business goals and marketing challenges of the people that we work with and helping them find amazing solutions. So that's a little bit about me, more than you probably want to know. Love it. Chad, introduce yourself. Go. Okay. So I am Chad Alexander. I am the video strategist with Story Collaborative. Uh, and that means that uh, from conception to retirement, um, I help uh, businesses uh, pretty much do their videos. So uh, it's, it's really fun. Uh, I apparently retirement was not a good word, but eventually videos have to retire. Uh, you know, even though they might be brought That's into true. again and again, uh, with re-releases, uh, they do eventually have to retire. So that's really true. Um, yeah, but love it. There you go. And hey, uh, regarding the watch party, if you guys aren't seeing the watch party uh, button, let us know because we have not been able to find it either, especially me. So you know, if you guys are are having the same problem as me, I would love to know. So let us know. Facebook comments. has been a little bit withholding with watch parties. We're not really sure what's happening, so we're going to keep checking it out and see if we can't get a definitive answer. They're they probably going to charge us to use it. <laughs> probably. Probably. They haven't told it. Like, there's nowhere officially that says like we're getting rid of watch party. So uh, supposedly it's a feature that still exists. We'll see. Um, I'm Amy Alexander. I am our creative director. I am really jealous for our brand and the brand of our clients. Um, my job is to make sure that everyone from the receptionist answering the phone all the way to your logo and your colors and everything in between is unified and telling the same brand story. Chad, who is S Plus Marketing Live brought to today? Brought to you by. Brought to. Today. What are we bringing this to? Uh, Facebook. Uh, no. Uh, let's see. Um, what, who are we sponsored by today? Who is our sponsor? Um, You're supposed to tell you us. You know, LaCroix, <laughs> LaCroix didn't give us enough money last week or the week before. So so we got Polar as our official sponsor now. Uh, Polar, seltzer water, get it wherever seltzer waters are sold. You're so, sort of seltzer you water uh, agnostic, aren't you? <laughs> I am, man. All I seltzer dabble, waters. I dabble into <laughs> all the seltzer waters, man. Because like certain brands... Lesson. It's a great lesson in brand loyalty, Chad. So, you know, these two companies should be duking it out for your brand loyalty. But right. Have they called you up? No. No. Come on, guys. I know, right? I mean, like, come on, guys. And then, I mean, next week, I might bring Bubbly in here, you know, Pepsi kids was, give me some money. I was right? just reading an article from Bubbly about, like, how they developed our brand and stuff. And the whole article was like, consumer research. And I was like, guys, you're not saying anything interesting. You're just saying the same thing everyone <laughs> says about how they market their stuff. Anyway. Um, but it seems to be working for them. So I'm, I'm happy for them. All right. Well, today we're going to be talking through some major news in the marketing world. and We're going to help you understand what that means for you as you're working through your own marketing efforts. Our first segment is always repeat after me. This is a segment in which we help you know what to say when your coworkers, your uncle Bob, 
or your daughter walk in and ask you a really hard marketing question. Our first question is what to say to your boss when he wants to know if your pay-per-click Google ads are doing well. Dave, you have an answer for us? I do. What do we say when our boss says, hey, are our pay-per-click, and by the way, bosses ask this because they're looking at the bill hitting their credit card. So, hey, how's the PPC ads doing? And the answer is, the safest answer is always to say, it depends. The real truth is, the PPC ads are, are going to be doing really well if you're getting the leads that your boss wants you to be getting. And if you're not getting any leads, then you're going to be pretty much stuck. Um, so really, the real answer to this is that based on industry standards, you can say our ads are performing uh, based on industry standards, either above or below the norm. One of the great places to find that is in a worksheet that has been put together by WordStream. Um, then they do these PPC benchmarks, which allows you to say, hey, according to the standard, well, here's how we're doing. Um, now, if the answer is we're below standard, then I'd suggest you also add, and here's what I'm doing about it, um, when you answer the question. It's better for you to know before you're asked rather than later. So, um, but I also think that it's also critical to think about whether or not those, those PPC ads are actually creating the value for you that you want them to create. Uh, in terms of leads and conversions of customers. So there's kind of a practical answer, and then there's this benchmark answer that's a good way for you to gauge how well you're doing compared to the rest of the market. Amy, you're going to put that link uh, somewhere that people can see it, I assume. Totally. Totally going to put that link. should be doing it as we speak. Um, I, what I like about benchmarking um, is that it's sort of, especially this is like a monthly report, right? So how PPC is doing this month especially in the middle of COVID, could be very different than even this time last year. Sure. So um, it's really helpful. Another thing to remember is that PPC can be, it's like renting instead of owning. So um, if you understand the difference between owning a house and renting a house, and that while there's some argument about this in Gen Z's world, um, the general idea that owning a house is an investment and renting is sort of throwing money down the drain, you really want your PPC to be doing well because otherwise uh, you are throwing money away. So. And also, I think, Amy, it's important to understand that, you know, the, there are, there's normally seasonal differences uh, on PPC. And so it's not going to remain static over a 12-month period. And then when we have a big market disruption like we're having right now, then all the ad benchmarks go out the window. So it's really helpful to see where, what's happening beyond your own little space uh, in your organization and see what's happening more broadly. And honestly, for a lot of folks during the COVID season, their ad numbers have tanked. Uh, because people stopped searching for that and now they're searching for this. So I think it's important to just uh, look at the benchmark to be able to look at where you are practically in your industry right now. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. So our next question in our repeat after me segment is what to tell yourself when you're not sure what content you should write next. You're sitting at your computer, you've set aside time to put some more fresh content on your website. Uh, and you just don't even know what to write about because there has been so much disruption. It feels like nothing you sell right now matters. <laughs> For a lot of us, it feels like I don't really know what to talk about. So um, we have some really, really great research from Google about what's, what people are searching right now. Um, there are some very interesting shifts. One of them is a 500% increase since January of 2020. Um, in the search term virtual. That includes virtual ways to travel even. So if there's something that, um, that you offer that's virtual or that you are creating virtual like, we have plenty of clients who have started to do virtual seminars. That's something that didn't used to be available that's now available. That's a really great thing to talk about. There's been a 100% increase in searches for boredom since last year. Uh, there's a lot of bored people. <laughs> I'm not one of them, but they're out there. Um, so you might have some really fun and creative ideas that are somewhat connected to your business that you can write about. 100% uh, growth in super mom. Wait a minute. Super moon. Super moon, super moon searches since last year. Um, so when Google was talking about this search term, they were just reflecting that people are searching um, for ways to innovate their space. They, they have lots of time and a small amount of space. And so um, they're sort of 
changing things up and finding creative ways to enjoy their space in different ways. So that was an interesting search. A 100% increase in online therapy, a 50% increase in study with me, video views. So study with me, video views. 60% increase in searches for easy blank. Could be easy recipes, easy painting tips. I don't know, I have no idea, but easy blank. So people are, are um, mentally, emotionally sort of done, even if they are bored. And so they're looking for really practical, simple ways to do things that maybe they would have liked to learn about before and now they just kind of want to get it done. 65% um, growth in the watch time of step-by-step -step or for beginners how-to videos on YouTube. A 100% more searches for memes since last year, which I think is just a reflection of people desperately needing to laugh, um, mm -hmm. needing some joy, you know, they're sharing, um, they're connecting with people in a different way than they were and so you just want to laugh. You know, um, this yeah. has been like a really great season for super funny memes. <laughs> That's true. I, I have seen so <laughs> many funny things. People are, they got a lot of time on their hands, so they're like being really creative. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> That's true. Um, and yeah, well, I won't go into politics. 80% um, more searches for DIY than last year. 200% increase in the global watch time of coffee recipe videos. And I've even seen these like people want to make their own Starbucks versions of stuff or I don't know. I have also seen like those coffee whipped coffee recipes. I don't know. I haven't tried any of these, but everyone's loving them. And a 45% increase in the views of recipes and cooking. So there's some quick ideas for you. You might be able to fit what you um, are working on into some of those cool search terms. You know, Amy, also by looking at these search terms, it also gives you a broader sense of like where people are in their heads. And you can see there's a lot of like wanting to get connected, wanting to try something new. And that can inform your writing just because you kind of get a general sense of the, of the mood that people are in. Now, I will say also that all these search terms, they're at the expense of something else. So it is, it is important, you know, as you're thinking about what to write now, it's, a, it's important to think about what are people actually searching for. Um, and I just wanted to mention, it's, it's also good if you're going to look at a term like this. So um, study with me, like if you were going to pick on that, you want to actually put that into Google and see what comes up. Because if it actually refers to something that you don't want to be connected to, if you, you know, the first page is full of stuff on studying, you know, something that's not related at all to what you do, then that term, even though people might get it, you don't want them coming to your site um, for a fake out, you know, for it to be clickbait, just to get them on the site to so true. kick off at you, right? So make sure that you, if you're going to write about boredom, that you actually address ways to help kids <laughs> with boredom. Yeah. And you don't write you don't write about, you know, something that's kind of a tangential joke on the word. So yeah. That's really good advice. Um, something else that I thought was interesting is that in the same report I was reading with these, they said that the first time the word quarantine dating was searched was March 1st of 2020. <laughs> and so <laughs> um, it's important to think through some of the search terms that might be new. I mean, quarantine dating was completely meaningless in January of 2020. Now everyone in the whole world knows what that might mean. And so there are a lot of terms um, that have been developed out of this, things that have quarantine as, um, as a descriptor. So you might do a little bit of Googling around to see what kinds of words and phrases people are using now that they have like a new existence. All right, last question for our repeat after me segment. What to say to your vice president when he only wants to film himself with a professional crew? Chad, I bet you have a great answer for this. Well, you, ha you have to make it authentic. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if it's uh, professionally done with, with uh, jibs, gimbals, uh, all the tools of the trade, um, as if it, if it's not authentic, it most likely will fall flat on its face. Um, and we've, we've seen this with, with brands where uh, it's very, very polished. It looks very nice. 
but the proof is in the pudding with the authenticity. Uh, having some ums and ahs and some pauses in the discussion helps bring that authenticity home. And even, even uh, places like uh, TED Talks, right? These are live events. So you'll have speakers kind of going, uh, and they'll stumble for their words. They even will uh, switch to another camera and cut out that audio where he's kind of thinking about his words, right? So you want to have, but you want to have some authenticity, right? Because um, not only are people craving authenticity, especially nowadays with, with everything going on with the political landscape and all that, but it helps, uh, it helps showcase your business in a more positive light instead of being something that is very uh, at arm's reach almost. So uh, keep that in mind. And the vice president, you know, he is only the vice president. So if, if we have to, I can go to the president and talk to him about authenticity. But anyways, don't that's, you think, what, that's what I would <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Amy. I was just going to say, don't you think people's tolerance for um, really, really low key? I'm in my home office slash bedroom filming about the new policies in our company don't you think their tolerance for that is really high and there's something really beautiful about that level of transparency even from yes. like you know c-level executives well the people are getting used to that these days with yeah. everybody being on zoom and blue jeans and that sort of thing uh it's it's becoming really normal and not only that uh like hubspot for example they have um like 300 employees that like are doing Q and A's and they'll just get out their smartphone and they'll do it on Instagram and they'll type out all the questions and stuff. So, it, you know, it's done live, but they'll go back and edit it with here's this question and here's, here's the, the top tips you want to know and stuff. So it's all live, but it's, you know, it, it's a little bit, a little bit it's still polished, but yeah, they're just like, they're just like in their room or something like, Hey, I'm going to talk to you guys about, you know, this marketing tip or whatever. So Interesting. That as as the authentic and the and the more personal becomes more normal, then doesn't the kind of traditional, highly produced, artificial doesn't that become abnormal? And so when people see something that's overproduced, it actually might have the opposite effect of something that was. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and and it's all about telling a story, right? Uh, if if you're if you tell a story effectively using authentic means, then great. If your story is better as a spectacle that is professionally done and you can pull it off and people love it, then that's great too. But you know, it's about the story that you're telling. Um, if, if your story is better served professionally, great. And if it's better served authentically, then do that. So, so there you, you go. And I read this, this question differently. I thought it said, what to say to your vice president when he only wants to film himself with a professional crew? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's what I thought too when I first read it. <laughs> That's um, all right. So on to our next segment. He's looking for hey. a new job. That's what it means. Maybe he's, I might be yeah, frozen. and maybe he's, maybe he's bored. No, you're not frozen. Am I frozen? Not on my end. No, you're not frozen. You're there. Where's Just that? Let it go, Amy. Oh, let it go. Oh, she she came back. She she bounced out. She bounced back. And you know what, Amy? I think we should see some ads in the wild. Do you have ads in the wild that we can see? I totally do. Am I frozen though? Because no, y'all are frozen. No. We see you. We Your see you. Line. All right, this great. Is new, this is a new phrase. Am I frozen? Am I right? frozen? <laughs> Am I frozen? They probably got like a bazillion searches on it. Probably Am I frozen. Uh, so ads in the wild. This is a great segment that normally Jennifer Bailey does. Unfortunately, she is not with us today, so I'm going to try to do it. I won't be as great as her, but I'm going to try. Um, so I drew inspiration for this segment this week from a book that um, I love. It's by Steve McKee. It's called Power Branding. Um, and he talks all about the importance of leaving gaps in your marketing for people to fill in themselves and become sort of get by in and sort of help create the picture. So instead of having marketing that's very um, connect the dots all the way, 
with advertising that it talks down to people and makes them feel dumb. Instead, sometimes you say something clever that forces someone to finish the story ever so slightly. Um, it can be more meaningful. So here's an example. This is a pretty abstract concept. So here is an example. Um, this is from Cadillac. It's a pretty old ad. Um, sorry about the apple cart. So they launched this new car. They put out this ad um, in, I don't, I don't remember, it might have been Rolling Stone. Or it, was, it was a very, very large magazine. Sorry about the apple cart. I did not get this ad. I was like, I did not go for an apple cart. I don't know. doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I asked Chad about it. I was like, explain the ad. <laughs> and he's like, isn't there something about a phrase like um, upset the apple cart or something? And I was like, oh, okay, great. So the first thing the Cadillac did was they did not connect the dots. They made me think about it. Um, for me, it did not work because I am so not their core audience. Not to mention this is a little bit of an older ad. Um, but their audience is super intelligent. They, they're making a little more money. They're not 30 years old, likely, right? That's not their core audience. And so um, this was an awesome ad for their target. And what Steve McKee says about the gap is, people are more likely to remember a picture they helped complete. Um, another great example of this is, is the 1984 ad by Apple that Jennifer actually showed a couple weeks ago. Um, that entire commercial had nothing to do with computers. All they said at the very end was something like, um, you know, on January 1st, 1984, Apple is going to, I don't know, change the world or something. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a great example of leaving this gap for people to fill in and complete the picture. They didn't say anything about all their amazing features. Um, there was really nothing about this new computer but is incredibly memorable. So there you go, ads in the wild. I love that idea. People are more likely to remember a picture they helped cool. complete. That's really cool. So I was wondering, so you're suggesting that Cadillac's audience is quite a bit older. Does that mean that leaving a blank in the, the storyline is actually like a IQ test or <laughs> you know, what, what are you saying? Exactly? I mean, in this instance, it absolutely is. There's lots of, there's also times when you leave a gap for the audience that um, that, well, there's age specific things. There's, there's gaps in advertising that are for Gen Z that I wouldn't get because I'm not that young either. But in this instance, it's all about their audience. Um, but also it was a bit of an IQ test. I mean, the phrase upset, it, it was right. The phrase upset the apple cart, um, is it, it, it's a sophisticated concept. The whole, the whole ad sophisticated. It's for a smart audience. Just is. Fascinating. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of kind of the story arc and how we, uh, we when there's tension in a story, um, what we are forced to do is we're forced to complete that. We're, we're, we're forced to think ahead. Mm -hmm. So these incomplete um, ideas create tension that our brains automatically, so you saw this, this car, you saw this Apple thing, and it didn't make sense to you. So that creates tension intellectual, it's called cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and it means that you have to, you have to resolve it. Otherwise, it'll stick in your mind until you resolve it, which is really a great strategy. So uh, I think the alternative is that we explain everything, you know, we could say, we created a car that's so much better than all the competition that we have, you know, totally upset the market. Well, who's going to remember that? And who would believe it anyway? So the, the strategy of incomplete story was actually really interesting. That's a great example, Amy. Yeah, the other thing about the, what you just said um, is that they are essentially saying that they've disrupted the market, but they didn't say it. Well, that's a bit of a promise. We've, ups, we've you know, upset the market. We've dis disrupted what's happening in cars. That's a disputable claim. And you never wanna make a claim that's disputable <laughs> if you can help it, um, unless you're ready you know, unless you have some kind of 100% guarantee, whatever. But making that claim can be incredibly dangerous. So they made that claim without actually making it. So it's not challenging and no one's trying to dispute it, you know. And they've, they've but, also made it in such a way that they have assumed it, that it's true. So they have assumed the facts and evidence. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they have said that it, we have so disrupted the market, we don't have to even say it. Yeah. We've just upset the apple cart. 
Yep. Sorry, it's done. And they Sorry didn't... about the Apple Group. Yeah, interesting. That's great. All right, Dave, you want to uh, talk to us about your term of the week? You gave us another oh, one just now, cognitive oh, dissonance. That. But... Oh, co that, that's not a term of the week. That's just for free. <laughs> Here's a term of the week. This is, a, this is an important term. And just this is my IQ test. Have I already shared the term of the week microsite? Yes, I have. I'm not going to use that one today then. Um, if you want to learn about microsites, go to the story-collateral.com homepage and click on the little red banner at the top of the page and you can learn more about microsites. The word of the day, the term of the week, the big concept for you to wrestle with today is personalization. Personalization. So this is, this is a, a very important term when it comes to reaching people. Um, this is not when you order your own um, personal stationery. Or this is not, you know, kind of wedding stationery or something like that, personal note cards. Personalization means that we take content and we make it uh, specific to the audience. So a, there's a lot of different examples of this and it kind of ranges. Um, on the high end, we have really smart uh, ad algorithms that are uh, touching bazillion data points and they're figuring out that Chad really should be drinking more of a certain kind of seltzer. And so they will send Chad lots of ads that have that seltzer in them. That's a, a little bit of an intrusive personalization and people are starting to get a little concerned about when they walk by a store, why is their particular brand popping up on the TV? You know, kind of things we've seen in some of the futuristic movies, but that's where the big ad uh, technology is going. Um, and there's some concerns about that, but at a more basic level, you know, you would think of personalization in an email. Does the email have the person's name in it? That's the most basic level of personalization, but that's not really the medium place or the best spot to land. The best spot to land with personalization is that we not only use the person's name, but we also give them the kind of things that they're interested in. So a couple of examples. If you are in a school and you have people visiting your website, so in our CRM, we'd be looking to see that certain people are visiting the athletics website or athletic web pages. And so if I'm going to send them email, I ought to be sending them some email about the school that has some ideas about athletics in it. Um, if I am on a uh, retail website and I'm always looking at the you know, golf shoes, then if I'm going to send them emails, they ought to have something to do with golf, right? I shouldn't send them ladies figure skating emails because they've been looking at golf. So the data does allow us to personalize without data, Without a CRM, it's almost impossible for us to personalize. It, now, here's the risk. If you don't personalize, then what you're going to do is you're going to tick people off. You're going to irritate them because you keep delivering them preschool or, um, or gluten-free um, advertising and emails and materials, but they aren't any of those things. They are glutinous people, and they want to eat bread. So don't send them that stuff. Glutinous. So Blurred glutinous. That's, that's not a real word. I made it up. But maybe it is a word, but it's not the word of the day because the word of the day is personalization. So the point here is that we really want to deliver to people what they're interested in. People have come to expect that websites will know what they want. People expect that. They've learned that from Amazon. They've learned that from all the streaming services. They've learned it from their bank and their doctor and the insurance company. So the big media companies have conditioned people to expect that your website, my website, will give them what they're interested in because it's smart. So I want you to associate those two words together. Personalization makes you look smart. That's it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, and misused personalization makes you look dumb. Just kidding. Makes you look intrusive and, <laughs> and no personalization makes you look like you've just checked out. Yeah. Makes you look like you don't care. Chad's always talking about this with YouTube because he served up ads that have nothing to do with anything he cares about. And he's like, I've been looking, I've been watching like, videos on YouTube for like yeah. how many years? I and mean, they still like, don't even know what I've I had an about. account with YouTube like for years and I don't like, it's like, you can buy the new 2020, you know, Xterra. And I'm like, I am not in the market for a car. I haven't looked at car <laughs> videos. Like it's ridiculous. So what they've done, oh Chad, goodness. is they've, they've profiled your uh, your data from other things, and they probably know what kind of car you drive, 
And so they think that people that drive what you drive, a 1970s Volkswagen bug, um, they probably also want to buy an Xterra. No. Uh, it's no, it's a crap algorithm. <laughs> it's crap. I mean, like they don't even advertise to be like the latest movies or anything like that. I, I yeah. watch movie stuff. First I watch movie video game stuff. On a ride. With, you would and the only the only video game ads they've served me up is their uh, Google Stadia because guess what? Uh, YouTube's owned by Google. So yep. that's you know, of course they're gonna be biased toward that, right? They're not gonna advertise here's Xbox stuff, right? Or PlayStation stuff. But it's still ridiculous. I, I'm thinking, wow, guys, you could really get more out of your ad bucks. If yeah, you, you would think, wisely. You think, given that it's owned by Google, they'd be a little more on it. Google have know. a game that's platform? Weird. Okay, that's another conversation. <laughs> there you go. That's another conversation for another day. Yep. Uh, all right, so let's move on to our next segment, the five W's. This is where we quickly tell you a story about something happening with one of the big brand names. Um, so today's story is yet again food related. Again, I don't, maybe I'm hungry when we're building these agendas. I don't know. Uh, but we're about to see a ton of Kraft Heinz stuff everywhere. Here's the story. Kraft Heinz, this is the maker of, you know, classic mac and cheese, ketchup, Kool-Aid, Planters Peanuts. Um, those brands that have been around since many of us were kids. Um, they have seen a major resurgence of people buying their stuff since COVID. People want comfort. They want brands that they know. They want brands that uh, they loved when they were kids. It's, I think it's totally an emotional, psychological thing. Uh, and so as people are stuck at home, they're buying more Kraft Heinz brands. And so uh, last week at their licensing week virtual conference, they showed this picture of all the licensing stuff they're about to come out with. Doo, doo, doo. So, you know, we're going to get um, masks. We're going to get little kids hats. We're going to have slippers at Christmas time. We're going to have back to school supplies. We're going to have onesies. Um, Guys, it's going to be ridiculous. Don't you think with that little Mr. Peanut right there, they're trying to compete with <laughs> Star Wars, the, the Mandalorian, the child? <laughs> they're totally trying to get in that market for sure uh, no i don't think so <laughs> oh my gosh anyway i think it's terrible uh but just be ready when you go into target sometime like maybe august ish be ready to see like a stupid amount of crap times crap everywhere um so that's our story let's wrap it up with our last segment this is our roll of the dice segment in which we could talk about anything chad what are we talking about today roll of the dice look at this dice I brought dice today. It's awesome. Okay, here we go. Roll the okay. dice. We're going to talk about the top three live videos that you can do. Okay. So this was this was a, a survey that was done by HubSpot, uh, gosh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and the respondents gave the top three videos that you could, live videos that they're willing to watch. So, hey, Cater, Cater when you think about your content that Amy gave you a lot of ideas for and you want to do a live video, these are the top three to do it. One is a live Q&A with a celebrity. Well, you, you know, most of us, we're, we don't have celebrities in our area, but uh, we do have presidents, we have vice presidents, we have CEOs, we have chief growth officers. We also could have, we have local celebrities. Yeah, local celebrities. Yeah, local celebrities. Yep. You could you get per, happily somebody. on your show. Huh? You could What's like that? invent a celebrity. You can make somebody yeah. up. Pretend yeah, they're I mean. Exactly. I mean, Sega's done this with Sagra Sanchiro. So there you go. That's that's another tri trivia tidbit for you. So uh, anyways, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, have a Q&A with someone who is who is well known or, or is well known in your company and just have them be an expert at something and talk through, you know, uh, I don't know, underwater basket weaving to use that little cliche. But yeah, and those do really well. The second type of video live video that does really well is a uh, product demo. So uh, you'd be surprised at how well these do. They they basically just, I mean, I, I've watched some online as well. Where they just take a camera and they're like, here, let's look at all the cool things on it. Oh, well, that does that. And, and uh, they, those do well as, as well. Um, and then the third one is, is really funny, but it's live streams of video games. Now, 
<laughs> you might be saying, well, Chad, that, that probably won't, won't help me, right? Um, live streaming of video games is becoming really popular because people want to decide whether or not they want to purchase the game. So they'll watch people play it. They'll watch, watch the different things you can do. They'll, they'll watch other people's reactions to it. But um, the only one of the ways I think this could work for you, um, best uh, before Best Buy purchased uh, Geek Squad, the CEO, uh, in order to chat with his employees, he would hop onto Xbox Live and play Halo and Call of Duty with them. And he would just chat with them on Xbox Live. So, you know, that, that could be a, a way of showcasing your culture. Um, if you do a lot of gaming in your um, kind of during your daily kind of routine, which I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> but that could be a way to utilize that. Um, it could be that you're a game developer. I mean, duh, that's, that's like a no-brainer. Uh, but yeah. Those, these are the top three. Now, a, I will... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, please. Oh, uh, one of the worst ones, though, and this was surprising to even me, but it makes total sense, is a live event slash conference. And I think I know the reason why. The reason why is that a lot of times, instead of doing the TED Talk where you have the multiple cameras and everything, you set up a camera in a corner like, like this. You set it up where you go like... You go out and now you can see everything. And I'm in this, I'm like way off in the distance and you can barely hear me, right? You can barely hear me. The audio is meant for, let me get this readjusted. The audio is meant for, um, meant for a live audience. So when you put it live, <laughs> you know, your audio is already not, not the way it should be. So yeah, that was that was uh, like a no brainer to me. So there you go. I got the a good idea. Three. For you. So what if you were to what if you were to do like uh, a newbies fail video gaming live stream? So you put somebody like a a school principal, a business owner, the mayor, and you put them in front of a video game console and you make a play and then you just you just watch it on stream it and you know they're gonna they're gonna get blown up, exploded, fall off, whatever happens. Yes. I mean, what do you think? Good that idea? would be great. Okay. Well, you know, Conan O'Brien, he does those video game kind of, kind of minutes or whatever where he That's plays a video game. And you have the, he always makes fun of his assistant who's all into the video games. He's like the nerd and he's like, why would you play this game? This game is annoying, you know. I mean, I have it's no really interest funny. in watching video games, but those with Conan O'Brien are hilarious. But there's other <laughs> interesting things you could live stream that are like that. Um, like, you know, if you're both cooking a new recipe together or something like that, or, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ideas that sort of could be spurred from that. So that's cool. Thanks for sharing, Chad. Yeah. Um, so Dave, do you have anything that you'd like to close with? Yeah, so I want to just brush off a, uh, a quote from an old movie. I'm sure Chad can tell us what year it's from. This is a Robin Williams quote from the Dead Poet Society. It's Latin, so this is not in term of the day, but it's, you, you guessed it, carpe diem. So. Um, seize the day. So I just want to encourage you, you know, things have changed and are changing rapidly all around you. And the probably the biggest trap we can fall into is just not doing anything and hesitating. And the only way you're going to figure out how things are going to be better or different is to start trying some stuff. Um, and you have to be active in your marketing and your sales. If you're not trying stuff and learning stuff, then you're really going to become stagnant, frustrated, depressed, bored, and lonely. So carpe diem, try something new. Maybe you can make a fail video out of it, worst case, or maybe you'll discover how to do something new that's really exciting and valuable. So that's all for today. I did mention on the homepage of the Story Collaborative website, story-collaborative.com, on the very top, there is a red banner that drops down with some new cool stuff that we're doing. So you can check that out. I'll uh, put a link there in there go. to the microsites. Well, that concludes our session. Thanks for that, Dave. Uh, remember, stories are the ultimate human technology. If you thought this was useful, please let us know. And remember, we're here every week, same time, same place. Bye, guys. Bye. Okie dokie. <laughs>